welcome back. Copying sounds like a questionable thing to want to get better at, but it's not, I swear. After all, copying is what most professional artists do when they join a studio, you know, like copying the style of the project that they're working on. I've done this my entire career and I'm here to show you how to copy any art style in this new episode of YouTube Art School. Uh-oh, uh we're late for class. Let's get to it. All right, class is in session. Pay attention. Learning to copy well is a fundamental skill for artists. It was basically the theme of last week's video about learning to draw well from imagination. It all starts with copying, but how do you get better at copying an art style rather than just a specific drawing? That's next level. Well, to answer this, first we gotta answer the question of what exactly is an art style? What goes into it? Just like a recipe, if you know what kind of ingredients go into it, it becomes a lot easier to reproduce. So what are those art style ingredients? I define an art style as a series of ways that artists have to kind of deviate from reality with their art. Like how they treat the fundamentals of art to create art that is consistently similar looking. Maybe that doesn't sound great, but like, you know, like with similar qualities to it. Like the secret sauce that makes something uniquely yours. And just like real sauce, there can be a lot of it or just, you know, it can be subtle. Let's say this is a real eye. Well, it is. But what kind of decisions went into kind of translating this into that? Clearly, it's still an eye, but it looks nothing like the reference other than that. And same idea with an illustration like this. We sort of understand what it's trying to illustrate, hopefully. But none of this looks real next to an actual photo. There's a lot of interpretation going from this to this. So then, before trying to copy an art style, we'll need to be able to observe or spot those stylistic choices that artists make. All or most of them. We're trying to figure out which ingredients went into an artist's secret sauce. And it's actually a lot of fun if you've never tried it. Let's check out some examples. Ah! A good place to start your observation from is by going down the list of some art fundamentals and seeing just how much each has been stylized. Those I'll typically pay most attention to will be the anatomy, the gesture, the values and colors, the design, of course, and when it applies, the perspective too. Beyond that, there's all the different preferences of any given artist, like how they draw a line weight, for example, or what kind of brush strokes they prefer when painting. Do they often use specific custom brushes or just how abstract or how figurative their art style is? Looking at this painting, let's quickly go down the list and see how much each fundamental is being interpreted. Not every fundamental will be relevant each time. I have a real photo here to compare, but roughly speaking, what I like to do with my anatomy is to over detail the muscles. So in a way, most of my characters end up looking a little more buff. And in terms of proportions, I'll usually have my legs be pretty long compared to a regular person. Usually they'll make up about half the height of the character. Then I have a much smaller rib cage compared to a real one. I'll also exaggerate the body type whenever I can, like in here, really emphasizing that hourglass shape. But really where I take the most liberties with the anatomy is going to be in uh, the head. I grew up watching anime, so a lot of my style is inspired by that. And so usually the eyes are going to be quite big compared to a real person. I tend to shrink down the nose considerably, the mouth as well, and basically just cram the entire face, including the eyebrows, in the lower half of the full height of my head. The skull is also going to be pretty big. The ears I don't really touch, but because of all the other changes that I've made, they seem to be disproportionately bigger. I grew up with this guy, what can I say? Now if we move on to the values and the colors, if we look at these two here in comparison, mine definitely has a lot more contrast. It must be because of all my years that I spent as a 3D artist, but I really love to sculpt the volumes of the body with my shading. But you can see here around the arms or around the waist, the range of values that I use is a lot larger. And I don't mind at all having black outlines if it helps to make the details pop a little more, even though clearly you wouldn't have that in real life. Values aside, I like to really saturate my colors. I love really colorful drawings when the colors pop a lot. I'm also a big fan of mixing opposite colors, so complementary colors. This is just a simple painting, but you can see it in action here as well where all the skin and the horns, you know, kind of this warmer tone. And to offset that, I went with a much cooler, you know, kind of legging and a grayish blue tank top. A more subtle thing that I like to do is to really emphasize the Terminator in my uh, shading. So this is going to be just a transition here, like the more saturated transition between the shadows and the highlights. This is something that you'll see in photos as well. It's just 
much more subtle, but I like it when it's right in your face. And also I am a big fan of material varieties. So for the hair here, as an example, giving it kind of this banana peel look, but with a slightly glossy, you know, kind of texture to it. Same thing with the skin. Whenever I can justify having a bright highlight, I'll definitely pop it in here. So around the nostrils here, on the lips, on the shoulder, even on the legs here. But like this area, like the skin here, I couldn't get it to be shiny as much as I wanted. No problem, I just decided to make the leggings a little shiny instead. And this is the kind of contrast that I will force into my paintings. Material variety just looks too good. All right, moving on to the design. And in this case, it doesn't apply. So let's look at this instead. Now, I will admit I am very textbook when it comes to my design sense. I take the rule of repetition very seriously. And if you look at this little character here, you can see that everywhere. So obviously the theme here was spikes. So she's got a pointy horn. She's got her morning star full of spikes itself. To go with the spike, I went for a slightly spiky fur instead of a like a soft bubbly one. I'm also repeating that spiky pattern here in the hair, even with the little green highlight to cap everything off. And we're not talking about colors anymore, but just to mention it here again, you can see the complementary colors at play. So bright red, bright blue, both complementary colors. And I'll usually have those colors be very saturated but just around the focal point, leaving the rest of the design kind of bland as to not attract too much attention. Now let's do this again real quick, but let's look at something else. I've got this random screen grab from the Demon Slayer anime. So let's check this out. So here, of course, we have the main character from the anime, Tanjiro. And I chose this specific anime because it has a very distinct style. This has a very specific way to handle anatomies. So like most stylized characters here, the main part that's going to be the most stylized is going to be the head. The bodies of the characters in the anime are fairly well proportioned, although kind of kid-like in their height. So they tend to be a little bit shorter, stumpier, you know, as opposed to an anime like Code Geass, where it's the complete opposite, where the character's just crazy long. So focusing on the head, the whole shape is going to be very circular. In a way, this gives the characters kind of a a cute look, you know, kind of like a kitten with big eyes and a round face. Moving to the facial features, they do some pretty interesting things, specifically with the eyes here, where it's always, almost always going to be these two types of lines. So kind of this thicker line for the upper eyelashes and a much smaller, thinner one for the lower eyelashes. But those lines are never straight. So they're always kind of these broken lines. Same thing with the irises, where it's going to be kind of this jagged, circular shape. Of course, the eyes compared to the rest of the face are disproportionately big. And most of their characters feature a really prominent forehead. So much so that from the side view here, it'll often block a good portion of the eye on the opposite side of the head. This portion here, very prominent. Also, unlike a lot of anime, where they tend to make their, their noses kind of tiny buttons. In here, we got some nice, long, pointy noses. And now we've been observing a lot, but I just decided to slap myself into this particular scene uh, to see, you know, how all of these things would be applied. So of course, I haven't had time to point out everything, but some of the things that we've already seen, you know, like the very strong forehead here covering part of the nose, kind of like the bridge of the nose line here leading into the eyebrow, the two broken lines for the upper eyelashes and the lower eyelashes, big eyes, the long nose, and uh, the round head. And slap on some colors, and then uh, it looks something like this. So obviously very sketchy, but I made myself into a bald uh, demon hunter assistant. I'm probably gonna end up being in his way most of the time. But yeah, when it comes to copying style, the most important is really finding those specific details, those specific changes or stylizations in the fundamentals, the ones that have the biggest impact and making sure that you focus on those. And working on this kind of exercise where you draw a character, maybe yourself, in an existing scene, so trying to match the style, but with a direct visual guideline, it really helps to bring your attention onto certain characteristics that will either make or break the drawing. And those are the ones that you want to pay the closest attention to, because just changing one of those key features like I just did here, changing the eyes, suddenly the character doesn't feel like it belongs at all in this anime. Highly recommend this kind of exercise, and it's super fun to do too. Now, it's one thing to know all this stuff, and it's another one to actually develop the skills, improve your fundamentals to the point where you can actually 
copy any art style or draw anything that your mind can imagine. But thankfully for you, that's exactly what I teach in my art program that you can learn more about with the link in the video description. It's currently on sale to celebrate reaching 19,000 students recently, and that discount will be valid only for a couple more days until the end of the month only. There's not a lot of time left, and it's the biggest discount I've offered all year so far. Check the link in the video description or go to cgart.school to learn all about it. You won't regret it. It's a project I am most proud of in my entire life. So now that we hopefully have a better idea of what to observe when trying to copy a style, let's actually try to copy one as I discuss my observation in the process. So let's look at this random artist. It could have been anybody, but we're going to be studying Sam Yang. I've seen his art on Instagram a couple of times before, but I just realized that he has a YouTube channel too. So I'll link to that in the video description. If you don't follow him already, I guess I'm pretty late to the party. Anyways, his style is very recognizable because of his specific treatment of the fundamental. So let's dig into it. Let's see if we can find some of the ingredients in his style recipe. So I guess most of his works are photo studies. So it's going to help us narrow down our focus to the anatomy, the colors and the brush strokes. I think those are by far are the most defining characteristics of his art style. Anatomy wise, it's very Disney inspired, I think. I've seen Frozen too many times because of my kids and I definitely see a lot of Elsa in how he stylizes the face structure. It could also be a different Disney character. I mean, they're all pretty similar. You know, like these big kitten eyes with a lot of eyeliner and long lashes, impressive eyebrows, and then the long nose bridge leading to a sharp button nose. The way he does the lips differ a bit though, usually favoring a bigger mouth and more I would say juicy lips or like OC lips, you know, like enhanced. Anyways, the jawline is also a departure from the Disney style. It's definitely longer, more prominent. The overall body proportions also seem very close with a generally like big head compared to the rest of the body. Just maybe not quite as much as Disney. Now moving on to the colors, he usually seems to tilt towards oversaturating the colors, going for very minimal shading and mostly focuses on the lighting rather than the shadows. It's kind of like cell shading kind of in its simplicity, but with soft transitions. There's also a constant emphasis on the bounce light in his paintings and an exaggerated terminator, which is, you know, the transition again between the highlight and the shadows, where that will be very saturated and definitely more visible than it would be in real life. His overall color palette's also usually on the warmer side. Finally, there's his use of brush strokes, which is going to be pretty significant for his style. More of a speed painting style, definitely, where the brush strokes are not hidden, but featured, you know, in a way. The focal point will usually have a lot more details and then the rest of the painting, like the side, you know, in the background will often be very simple, very minimal in the brush strokes. Kind of messy looking if you just look at that, but because the focal point is so well rendered, we kind of don't notice as much. Also, it looks like he sometimes uses the Spider-Man dot brush and we can also see the use of a rake brush very often. And other than that, it's basically just a basic soft brush, I would guess, a basic round brush with hard edges, and then, you know, few textured brushes for details. Seems pretty basic and not in a bad way. You know, I don't use many brushes either, which just, you know, goes to show that you don't need anything fancy to create beautiful arts like his. And after my first try, I think this isn't too far off the mark, right? I'm only doing this as a demonstration though, obviously don't straight up copy his art style and, you know, pass it as your own. Not like it's easy anyways, but that's not cool. Art styles are born out of a mix of different influences, not just one. And more importantly, if you ever work in a team or project that has a specific art style, you should be better equipped to fit in and create art that's consistent with the style of the project. And that's going to be it for this week's class. Now, of course, copying a style makes sense in the context of a studios with multiple artists working on the same project. It also definitely has a place as a learning tool for you to get better. But, you know, again, just to make sure copying another artist's art style and passing it as your own is clearly bad. If you do copy anything, you know, as a study, always give proper credits if you post it online for others to see. So there's no ambiguity. And by the way, if you've ever wondered how to develop your own style, I have a video going over that right here in the top right corner of the screen and down in the video description. Check it out, it's a pretty good one. Also, if you want a lot of the brushes that I use for these paintings, I actually offer one of my brush set for free with the link in the video description. It's a pack of 18 brushes, some of the ones that I use the most, hard to beat that kind of value. So go get it now if you haven't already. All right, let's wrap this one up with a special announcement about next week's video that you won't want to miss. It's going to be about...